nice place. And McBride had a good band. Dickie McBride was a good singer. <clears throat> Not a country singer, no kind of way, more of a pop ballad singer. Like his idol was Perry Como, for instance. Anyway, the uh, Sons of Pioneers came out with a beautiful song uh, called I'll Keep Riding, Hiding Teardrops in My mm -hmm. Heart. And you'll never know I cried when I found out you lied, so I'll keep riding, hiding teardrops in my heart. <clears throat> and they were humming the background, and whoever it was was the lead singer, Bob Nolan, whoever gave a recitation on it, said, you know, they say that a cowboy's not supposed to cry, but he's got a heart just like you and I. And I overheard one on the range as I rode by today, and I could hear him saying, though I'm pretending that I think he'd get back into the bridge. Mm -hmm. Well, Mac Bride would sing that song well. Mm -hmm. And Buck Henson or Red told me this story. So they been doing it. So they done it to the tale this night. So Mac Bride sang it all the way through real good. And the band was playing, and J.R. steps up to the mic and gives the recitation. Mm -hmm. And like I say, the original was, that, you know, they say the cowboy and folks. J.R. stepped up to the mic and he says, now they say that a cowboy ain't supposed to cry, but that cat's got a heart just like you and me. <laughs> so I overheard one on the range the other day as I rode by and he said, boy, I sure need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> on the radio. And yeah, and Mac Bride's had to come back in. <laughs> you know, man, where did this come from? And, uh, now one night y'all went by to pick up J.R. and his wife told him not to go off with it. Well, he can't, but after that, uh, I went to work in a, with Buddy Duhon. Cliff had let Buddy Duhon go for whatever reason. And Buddy started the band, and then the band was Billy Carter and myself and Deacon Anderson and Shang and some drummer. And Gerard left Houston to come to Beaumont, and his uh, wife's mother had a big house over there. And so Gerard wanted a job, so he called Buddy to go work with us. <coughs> so then I'm going to play with Gerard. And we go to buy to pick him up to go play up at Baby Galvez on the matinee. And his wife and her mother's out on the porch and there's J.R. and we pull up and blow the horn. For whatever reason, she didn't want him going off. And she said, J.R. said, if you go off with those guys, I says, I will not be here when you get back. He said, sure, go miss you, honey. Let's go. And <laughs> jumped in the car. <laughs> and she stayed with him until he died and anyway. And uh, that's when we got into the singing thing with Mm. Uh, well, now, yeah, it's tough. Billy Carter, of course, is one of the great guitar yeah. players, uh, swinging and driving, and I just turned out to be a great guitar player. But uh, talk about his first couple of uh, meetings with, with J.R. and Billy Carter. Well, that was that particular one, and, and Billy was 16 years old. And uh, real shy, believe it or not. Then he was real shy, and he was learning to play guitar, and he was really getting off on the good right track. He was listening to Don Tyler, who played with mm -hmm. Cliff this time, and who played a Oscar Moore type style guitar that wasn't that cold. You know. Billy was really getting into, into playing pretty good, but he was still shy and, and not full-fledged yet. J.R. could care less about any of that, so we picked J.R. up, and J.R. gets in the back with me, and Buddy's driving, Billy's in the front, and J.R. known to indulge in several different things himself. So we get on the road headed for Sealsby, which is about 30 miles from Beaumont, and he, JR said, hey man, let's sing, punch me, let's sing a trio. He couldn't wait to get up there and play, let's sing a trio. And I said, okay. He said, all right, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, uh, he punched, he just met Billy. Billy's in the front, boy, and all JR back there. Punched him on the shoulder, hey man, he punched him like that. He said, we're going to do tumbleweeds. And he said, you, you, you sang the lead. And he said, Clyde, you sang that second. He said, I'll catch that third. <laughs> like, I'm the only guy in the world can do that, right. you know. One, two, three. Billy's wasn't a, he starts real shy. See, he said, hell, man. J.R. said, hey, he must been, <laughs> man, that's terrible. He said, yeah, let's try it again. So J.R. counts it off, you know, here's shy Billy. Billy gets the line too. He said, damn, man, you sang terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I had to jump in. I said, hey, J.R. I said, Billy's the guitar player in the band. He said, I said, he's not the singer. He, he don't sing. And he says, damn good thing because he sure can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> Billy felt like jumping out of the car, uh, you know, but that was J.R.'s personality. Yeah. Anyway. So I jumped way ahead, and years later, Billy got 
to playing really good and went to work for Wills. And Billy's telling me this story. He never saw Jr. anymore <coughs> after what I just said. And years later, he's playing with Bob Wills, and and uh, they book in the farmer's daughter in Beaumont. Well, Jr. then ends up there playing with Adolf Hodder. San Antonio, what? San Antonio, yeah. Jr. up there with Adolf Hodder, and then this is years later, and Billy was not shy anymore and didn't no reason to be and played really good. So that Bob Wills' bus pulled into Farmer's Daughter and JR's leaned up against the front door and he knew most of them and they knew him. <coughs> he said, stepped off of the bus and said, one of them walked up, shook hands with JR. Hey, JR, don't you meet our new guitar player? This is Billy Carter. He said, you must not be very good. I ain't never heard of you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just really never did work out. Well, so JR was pretty direct. He had about as much tact as, uh, yeah. He kind of said it like, well, if he didn't play, well, he didn't have much. But he was a swinging player and, oh, yeah. and the phrasing. And oh, yeah. Yeah, he was all that. Now, cool. during that time in Beaumont, there's a couple of stories that I've heard you talk about uh, when you met Johnny Gimble. Mm -hmm. Johnny's kind of starting out. I think he's about, what, four years older than you? Yeah. And uh, uh, tell a couple of stories when, when well, you guys I, met over there. First time that we... We saw he saw me. Uh, he, he he told this was I was with Blue Line Playboys, and him and his brothers had moved down to Baytown from Tyler Goose Creek, they called it. And they got a radio program on KRCT down there, and I was playing with Blue Bonnet Playboys, and we played Baytown some, and and uh, John and his brothers apparently came out there one night while we were playing, and I really didn't know it at the time. And shortly after that, I went to work with uh, went back to Beaumont River. And me and Lee Bale would be riding around in the car, and he had a radio in his car, and after we got off our program, I was turning around on the radio, and I picked up 650 on there, and heard a good fiddle player. I said, who is this? And I knew it was a live show, which most of them was in. Anyway, it was Johnny Gimble and his brothers playing on KRCT. I said, well, this guy plays good. And not knowing at the time that he was probably listening to ours as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, he come. Anyway, uh, Playing with Moon's Forest Club, and uh, just before we quit one night, well, Johnny comes walking in with his fiddle and walks up to the bandstand. And I wish he'd got there earlier, but he didn't. Anyway, he walked in, and, and I had my fiddle out, of course, because I was playing. I jumped over the rail, and he got his out, and we jammed a little bit out there with the bandstand. And Link Davis was playing uh, after midnight thing over to Showboat in Louisiana, so. Johnny come over to some guy, I don't know who he was. I don't think he was a musician. Anyway, we got in the car together and rode over there. Me and Johnny and whoever this guy was went over there and listened to Link the rest of the night. And of course, Johnny went on back and the next time I saw him, he was with, uh, with Bob Wills next time I saw him. Mm -hmm. He told me something about with uh, the first time, I guess it was, uh, Johnny hadn't met J.R. And he was, he'd come over looking for J.R. or something. And he had never met J.R. yet. He hadn't? Yeah. Or J.R. hadn't met him. Anyway, they, 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 hadn't, they hadn't made contact yet or whatever. There was a story about, about that. Hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't recall. I don't know. He was telling it. He was? Yeah. I don't, I don't recall. I don't know. Anyway, he, he'd listened to him, of course, been, been, been yeah. digging him, but he hadn't met him yet. Oh, okay. And I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember how that encounter was, but well, we went over here to Link, you know, and Link was another another thing. He's with us with the Blue Bonnet Playboys, and then, of course, I played for him a bunch of times and through the years, and he, uh, Cesar Massey, mm -hmm. great storyteller and fiddle player and all, and Cesar tell him about this playing over there, and him and Link was in a hotel in Alexander, Louisiana, and we are going to play somewhere that night with somebody, and Link had been known to light up a few for the job anyway. He said Link got dressed and everything and got all impatient. He said, I'm going to go down in the lobby. and said, I'll wait for you down there. And Caesar said, okay. He said, I'll go get dressed and I'll be on down a little bit. So Caesar said he got cleaned up and everything and dressed. And he'll meet Link down in the lobby of this hotel. And he goes down there and no Link. Well, where in the heck's he at? Where in the world did he go? They were supposed to go out that job together. So a little bit he heard a saxophone coming through the hall, window wall. And he knew it was Link. Mm -hmm. You can tell away from that. That's, that's Link somewhere playing a horn. So he walked out on the sidewalk and looked and there's a little lounge next to this hotel where they're staying. 
said he opened the door and walked in there and Lincoln went out on the street and brought a blind man in there. There's a blind man on the street corner with a cup playing the guitar. And Lincoln brought that guy in that little lounge and had him backed up in the corner and was playing the blues on the side <laughs> with this blind man playing rhythm for him. He said Link took about five or six courses and finally took his horn out of his mouth and says, Damn, man, change cars. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Lincoln, it was Eddie Caldwell, it was kind of buddies? Yeah. Kind of yeah, running they, together. They're they going to t t take a little Troy under their wing. Yeah, they come through the view and the way Troy's tell me. Troy's dad, Troy Passmore's daddy had a grocery store for the view and, and uh, Eddie and Lincoln come through there and stayed for a while and Troy had some talent they could see and they took him with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> told Troy's daddy, we'll, we'll watch after little Troy. You know, it's kind of like leaving town with the Dalton game. <laughs> and, uh, shoot. And anyway, uh, there's a lot of Eddie Call. I never played with Eddie, but I did hear him play and saw him play several times. He played in, with Cliff, and then I saw him at the Walter Tell Blue Room. And mm -hmm. Some good Eddie Caldwell stories. And one of them, Charlie Reisinger told me about it. Charlie was a drummer. And uh, he said they played in Longview or Kilgore. One of the places where in East Texas there's a bunch of oil wheels and stuff. And said they had a sit down job there and played every night in the radio program every day. And said we got to playing at night and started to go to their room where they're living. And Eddie told them, said, No, nah, I'm going to walk on tonight. I said, Y'all go ahead. I'll see y'all at the radio program. I'm going to walk on. <clears throat> so Eddie walked, there's a bunch of pumping oil wheels. So Eddie walked across these oil wheels going to where it was he stayed. So the next morning at the radio program, Eddie wasn't there. The one where happened to Eddie Caldwell, he didn't come to the program. So they got the job that night to play, and he was there. And they said, hey, man, what happened to you? You wasn't at the radio program today. And he said, well, said, last night I was going to walk home. He said, I walked among them pumping oil wells. He said, I got to listen, and one of them was going to pump, 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 pump. Man, that's laid down a good beat. He said, I got my fiddle out and jam with them. So sum up. He <laughs> back the guy. Sit down in the oil field when the sun comes up. Sat there playing fiddle with an oil well. Yeah. Yeah, that's, who would have thought of that? Now you're talking about uh, Troy Passmore, uh, who played fiddle, but obviously guitar was his yeah. main instrument, played real good. Yeah. Uh, but hung up. All kind of Troy stories. Two stories I want you to tell, make Thank sure you. we get them. You said, two of the funniest stories, you ever, things you ever saw, and Troy was in both of them. One of them with Daddy and the other one with, yeah. with you. So you need to tell, tell those two stories, yeah. set those up. Well, anyway. Going on back to Beaumont when I first started, and I was with Sh in Shelley's band, and he and I had a radio program every day. When school was out, called the two of us. And if we got a playing job, we'd hire some extra guys. So anyway, this particular summer, we'd made it with the band that way, and I had to go back to school. So uh, after I'd gone back into school, well, Shelley hired four or five extra guys all the time. And, and, and man, I wanted to hear them real bad. And I was in high school then, so they had a radio program on KRIC about 3.34 in the evening. And uh, I said, I'm going to go down there and hear what he's put together. I'm going to skip this last class and walk down there to the radio station and hear who he's got. So when I got down there, he had the Troy. They had two fiddles. The only thing is, they only had one fiddle. <laughs> Troy Pashmore was going to play fiddle, and Shelley played fiddle, but Troy didn't have a fiddle. And if you can imagine a band with two fiddles in it and they have one fiddle. <laughs> well, he hired Troy because she, Shelley couldn't play any, any hot fiddle, as they call it, or hokum or whatever, and he could only play the melody. It was the other way with Troy. Troy couldn't play the melody, but he could take mm -hmm. hot of up courses, you know. So Shelley would start to tune off on the fiddle playing the lead, and while he sang, he'd hand the fiddle to Troy, and then Troy would step up and take a so-called hot course and then hand it back. Mm -hmm. So while Shelley's singing and playing, Troy just stands there. It, <laughs> what else can he do? So that was the fiddle section, and on the piano he had a guy named Les Bryan. A big mouthful of Benjamin Green paper. And a good guitar player, Fats Beard, the one that done the sell my, I mean the shift turned around long ago. <clears throat> he was apt to do anything. He was playing the guitar, had a bass player, so I go and sit down to hear, see this radio program. I wasn't involved in the playing part. And I, I wanted to hear these guys, especially Fats and Troy. <clears throat> so I 
So they're on there, and Chevy starts to tune off on the fiddle, and then he hands it to Troy, and Troy will step up and play his hollow butt and hand it back, and there's Troy just standing there. So Chevy's getting ready to announce their dance dates or something, and, and one of the strings slipped a little bit on the fiddle, so Troy's had it over there on his knees, standing up, ding, 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 trying to tune it back up. And Shelly says, now we go to our announcer for a commercial, so we're off the air for a couple of minutes. So we switched it back to the announcer in the other room, so Shelly got anxious, and he said, let me have it. And took the <laughs> fiddle away from Troy, and I'll tune it, you know, like in a hurry. <clears throat> Just as he went to tune it, he wound the string up. The string broke and the bridge flew off of the fiddle just as the announcer said, now here's Shelly and threw it back and there on the air. He stood there with a the fiddle. <laughs> In the meantime, Fats Beard, the guitar player, got irritated about that. He just put the guitar down and walked out. Well, Les Brown had been wanting to play that guitar anyhow, but he wasn't near Fats, Fats' class with it, or Troy's. So Les seen him put that guitar down and go out the door, so Les runs and gets Fats' guitar. In the meantime, the fiddle had come apart, and Shelly told Troy, get the guitar. Troy goes over and takes the guitar away from Les, who gets mad and leaves, and they had time for one more tune, and Shelly says, Elf, Troy, and wants to sing it in G. <laughs> he didn't have nothing to give him a pitch, and Troy didn't know to give him one, and he didn't know to wait for one. They went off there with Troy playing in Elf, and Shelly singing in G. It was just in two left. <laughs> As in, nobody witnessed this but me. This is a radio program that yeah. will go down in history, but I'm the only one that know it. And so, what did the Daddy do at the end? Was over when, when they when they went off there playing in one key and singing another. He he had that fiddle with the bridge off of it and the strings hanging down, and he starts over to the wall. He said, "You are going." <laughs> I thought he was going to bust it over the wall, you know, and <clears throat> of course I went after we got back over in Houston and. Shelly got out of the business, I went back over to Beaumont to see my dad, and I said, well, tonight I'll go and visit with Troy. And I hadn't seen him in a while. Troy was 16, uh, he's about 18, 17 years old, 